Well, Steph, FUBAR Sports today. Baseball is back. Woo. Woo. All right. Well, that's sports. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, no, man, this is uh, I-, I wanted to cover something that is going down in Mexican soccer. And since we're talking about soccer, I do have to play this. Open wide for some soccer. The Continental Soccer Association is coming to Springfield. It's all here. Fast kicking, low scoring and ties. <laughs> you bet. Yeah. Um, So let me pull up the article here from the LA Times. Uh, There's some images that have been coming out of the main soccer stadium in central Mexican city of Querétaro as, uh, and they're pretty, they're pretty bad. These images, Um, a riot breaks out because of the uh, rivalry that the soccer teams Atlas versus Querétaro took place about a little bit over a week ago as we're listening to this on the podcast. But on Saturday, um, that it was a Saturday early in the second half of a Mexican league game between visiting Atlas, the reigning champion and Querétaro FC, a team that has never finished better than sixth in the standings. A riot broke out in Estadio Corregidora named for a hero in Mexico's war of independence. Fans attacked one another with chairs, metal bars, knives, belts, fists, and feet, with other official reports saying that as many as 26 people were hospitalized, three in critical condition. Uh, competing reports said that, an, that that number was nearly twice as high. Holy shit. And then on Sunday, the local government said that there were no fatalities, but there was like these crazy amount of images of bloody and unconscious bodies. Like, in the stands, including one man lying naked in a pool of his own blood. Oh, my God. And as well as interviews with some victims and family members indicated fans were killed. And, you know, people's family members hadn't returned home. Um, There's been some people who was like, yeah, my friend never came home or my brother or sister never came home. Shit like that. Why are they trying to cover this up? Um, there's some speculation that they want the World Cup to come to Mexico, and so they want to paint their soccer organizations in the best light possible. If anything, this is just doing the complete opposite because, you know, social media is going to expose a lot of this, especially with people going to social media and saying, I have mm-hmm. a family member that has not returned from this fucking event. Yeah. You know, and there's, there's, there's these crazy images of like this, like a man shielding a child while a mob comes over and like kicks the shit out of them um, so or, or a family that uh, that is running trying to run out of the property and uh, the mom has to take off the kid's jersey in hopes that you know it doesn't because you know, jerseys like we're a target yeah that, that means that you, you know the uh, the opposing team knew who you rooted for and then they would come and go kick your ass so um there was there's a few photos that were tweeted um, in confirmation of one of these dead fans, an Atlas fan. Uh, at least two other videos surfaced Sunday of Atlas fans who insisted that they had friends who died in the stadium attacks. In response, um, the Liga MX, Mexico's domestic soccer league, pointed back to the state statement that nobody had died. Many were questioning that though. That's fucked up. So the league was just like, well, the government's saying nobody died, so we're cool, right? No. Like, people aren't accepting that as an answer. Um, A quote here that I've got says, Mexico's had a history of distrust with government officials over death tolls, whether that's students gone missing, whether it's femicide, whether that's COVID deaths. Uh, This was uh, Hercules Gomez, a former U.S. national team player who spent six seasons in the Mexican League. There's a history of government misinformation and distrust amongst his people, and that's going on right now. That's the worst part. That's the scary part. Uh, Atlas supporter groups who took to social media to post lists of those known to be hospitalized and notices seeking information on the safety and whereabouts of others who has who have disappeared in the violence at a team in uh, at a team stadium in Guadalajara. A candlelight vigil was held. Um, you, you guys, anybody can go out there and check out these uh, videos. These. Uh, pictures of like just people just running for their lives some people like just getting the shit kicked out of them uh by these uh i guess you can call them you can call them hooligans but i I can't think of a worse word right now because it's pretty fucking indefenseless about what happened 
Um, it's just pure rage because they have a rivalry between teams. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jeez. Pretty much. And I'm wondering, like, okay, so if their friends or family haven't been found, what are they doing with these bodies? They're, they're, they're getting rid of them, yeah. I'm sure. I mean, any any government wants to get rid of a body will just incinerate them and with just say such they don't know anything about it. With such a public event like that, there's going to be cameras. There's no way to hide what's going on. Yeah. So the fact that they're lying about it and saying, yeah, yeah there were no deaths, it's, it's like, all right. You calling us stupid, <laughs> right? Yeah, and it's just making this whole the, this whole situation worse. Oh my um, I mean, y you can point some blame. That's tragic. Um, a lot of it was because of the hardcore Querétaro fans, also known as Barras Bravas or fierce gangs in Spanish. Most, if not all, of the people who were hospitalized were Atlas supporters. Uh, also, blame could be put on uh, that the security detail was really relaxed for this kind of rivalry game, which was largely, largely made up of privately contracted officers who were slow to react and ineffective at controlling the violence. The Querétaro club president, Gabriel Solares, said that during a news conference that they were 600 security personnel in a stadium that seats nearly 34,000 people. So why a more robust security presence wasn't on the site for a match between teams with a recent history of fan violence certainly will be addressed in the multiple investigations being promised. Also to be addressed is why barriers meant to separate the rival supporter groups were easily breached after a fighting began in the stands, allowing the violence to spill onto the field, too. Yeah. So, um, it's the darkest day for Mexican soccer. Um, mo a lot of people are saying a lot of newspapers and publications and I mean, it just got out of control. I, I know that we already saw this happen in the Simpsons. Uh, in fact, it was probably worse on the Simpsons, but this happened in real life where people d actually died and, uh, I, that's not what you want, man. That's not what you want. Why would you bring up the Simpsons at a time like this? This is an utter tragedy. Like people died. Yeah, the system, the Simpsons did it already. Uh, we understand that that's a problem, but it's not just a brown people problem, said Ger Sergio Tristan, an attorney in Austin, Texas, uh, and the founder of Pancho Villa's Army, the, s the largest organized group of Mexican soccer fans in the, in, the U in the U.S. There are problems across the world. So then this article goes to point out all the other kind of similar disasters that we've had. I mean, y you... you heard about this kind of thing all the time when there's a, a Dodgers and Giants rivalry where some of our knucklehead mm -hmm. fucking idiot Dodger fans uh, beat the shit out of somebody and have to send them to the hospital, likely paralyzing the poor asshole. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, France and England have had their hooliganism often triggered by social tensions with violence also so commonplace in the UK that it was referred to as the English disease and women and children were dissuaded from attending these games. Um, I think that, you know, soccer in particular and here in Southern California, baseball often, um, it, it just it just crosses that line really regularly and that has to stop. Who knows what they're going to do, what kind of sanctions, what kind of investigations that they're going to do and particularly in this event for, for, this, uh, for this Mexican soccer game. Um, but I think the governor of that state said that he was going to call for the arrest of you know, the murderers of these people. So I don't know what kind of investigation is going to be taking place. Um, if the governor is recognizing that there's been some fuckery afoot, you know, uh, hopefully there, this will realign itself to become a major investigation. Um, let's see. FIFA is calling for their, it's, it's calling this whole thing barbaric and encourage local authorities to bring swift justice to those responsible. Um, uh, CONCACAF, the federation that oversees soccer for 41 member states in North America, Central America, and the Caribbean, called the violence shocking and said that it condemns its behavior. Also called for an investigation and sanctions. So um, it's it's just one of those things where, you know, these larger organizations need, need to hold the league accountable and uh, and the government needs to get its head out of its ass and, and find who these people died and let those families know and and why they tried to hide it to begin with i know it's probably because they wanted to uh, good standing f with fifa to get that world cup but it's not worth it it's not fucking worth it um so uh i don't know man good vibes to those positive vibes to the people out there man there's nothing i can do from over here it's just so tragic and uh you don't want to see this kind of thing so 
um be fucking responsible when you go to these these games people i'm mm-hmm. glad none of this really happens too often down here but uh you know, when Mark Maples was here not too long ago, a few weeks ago, he mentioned the uh, the uh, the soccer hooliganism culture that uh, is eh, it's kind of the negative part, the the ugly part of soccer and and sports uh, fanaticism, uh, you know, as a whole. Right. But uh, I don't know, Steph. What do you think? It's just barbaric. What mm. happened? Like it should have never escalated to that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Especially when children are involved. It's supposed to be a family event, and yeah. now you know now families don't want to take their kids anymore. It's just going to be a bunch of hooligans. Um, I don't know. We'll see. Well, I, I hopefully you know this this will get stadiums like this and, and situations like this where there's rivalry games happening to beef up their security and actually you know take this seriously because more shit like this is going to happen if you don't if you don't calm down you know the drunks and the hooligans and people are just that are just going there with the worst intentions. Uh, but anyway. That's all I had for FUBAR Sports. Did you have anything? Nope. Nope. I don't even know why I asked. Nope. All right, here we go. Uh, let's finish this off with the music highlights. Well, Steph, like we've been doing in the last few weeks, our, our genre carousel of, uh, of song picks for this week, uh, you got pop, pop for this week. Uh, I've never heard of this artist before. His name is Thomas Day. How did you come up on him? Oh, you know, perusing around the top new releases. Mm-hmm. And I like the beat of this one. Yeah, this song is a, it's a new single that Thomas Day came out with called Bonnie and Clyde. And that album put you two on the map and uh, they've, they're still running, man. They're still, they're still fucking doing it. Um, I, I don't think that some people can forgive them for what happened, you know, all those years ago when they suddenly appeared on your iPhone's playlist. <laughs> I think it was a promotion with the new iPhone and their new album. I think Songs of Innocence and it and people were like, "What the fuck is this U two album doing on my phone?" That's still going on. <laughs> there, there's albums are still appearing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brand new iPhones. I, I saw U two only once. And my God, they pu- they put on a performance. Yeah, it is spectacular. Yeah, they play all the hits, and they really you can you can tell they love their fans too. Mm-hmm. They try to incorporate the fans into their shows. I remember this is probably before Kings of Leon really started getting big because. Kings of Leon actually opened up for them. Oh, and this nice. is when they still had their long hair and their long beards. Uh huh. Put on a solid show. Then U2 came on. And throughout their show, they would pull people from the audience and have them walk and dance on stage with them. Mm-hmm. So I was like... That's pretty dope. You don't really see too many bands do that. But yeah. But it was, it was amazing. No, that's dope. I, I wish I get, I get to see um, U2 before they get you know too old or break up or retire. Or who knows? Yeah. Um, yeah, one of these days, I hope they come to SoCal and I can get a ticket for that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, man, that's uh, that's going to do it for the old music highlights today. And actually, Steph, this just in. Uh, I, I should have pulled up my... Uh, do I have a breaking news? Hmm. I have a breaking news. Uh, let's see. Breaking news. I guess I don't. I don't have a breaking news uh, drop. Uh, Tom Brady is unretiring. Oh, what? That shit didn't last more than a couple of months, man. Uh, uh, Tom, it didn't even last a month. He's going to return for a 23rd season in the NFL. Uh, he's he's going to stick around with the, uh, with the Buccaneers. He was already bored of being off for a month. I guess. Uh, and I thought he was going to be in a movie, unless his part in that movie wasn't so much that it was going to take him away from playing in the nfl probably not but i don't i guess more to come on that but you know uh, i just wanted to get that in there because it just came up on my phone and uh i, w- I would have been like ah oh, shit we missed it 
Well, Brady's back. Brady's back, everybody. Oh, you, you know what? One last thing we forgot to talk about was huh. the boys. Oh, the boys. Yeah. We want to talk about that next week? Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Next week, we'll finally have Tanner Poppet on. I know we've talked about him for the last two shows. <laughs> uh, he, he was on uh, season one of the Food Bar Show. Don't, don't go back and listen to that. Uh, Isn't that archived now? It, it's, you know, I keep forgetting to take it off. It's still there. Archive it. Uh, anyway, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, man. Tanner Pop, it's on next week. And uh, we're probably going to be having some musical guests on in the month of April, maybe spilling into May and June. So, you know, as, as things get more relaxed, as people get more confidence in going out and enjoying themselves again, uh, we're going gonna, we're gonna to fully take advantage of that. So, uh, look forward to some cool people on the show. Anything else you wanted to talk about there Steve we can talk about the boys next week um yeah so donate if you want uh, more special effects and the like on your viewing pleasure for Le Fubar show mm-hmm, mm-hmm. donate yeah man go to our website uh, send us a tip PayPal um, we'll see a thing we got Venmo. Venmo yeah so send us some love or uh, enjoy your grass store and make sure you click through our banner on foobarshow.com at the bottom there and uh, show some love that way. But uh, aside from that, thank you all very much for listening into the Foobar Show. Remember to hit subscribe and be sure to rate, review, and tell a friend like a freaking champion. You can also listen in and get our swag at foobarshow.com. That's f o bar show.com. And follow f o bar show on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. Join in, drop us a line, and we'll fill it up like a couple of foos. Ah! I've been Joe C. Now Seth. Signing off saying, don't be a